hope you all had a, a good Thanksgiving, and um, it's nice to, I can't believe we're already into Advent season, seems like it starts earlier and earlier, and we got December right around the road, and just crazy how time flies when you're having fun. I want to thank um, several of you who have helped out to decorate the wonderful church we have this morning with the decorations, and also several of you um, last, yesterday were um, able to put down the nativity scene out front. I don't know if you saw that as you came in. Great job on that. So I just want to thank you so much for, for doing um, the decorating and the, the, the work that goes into that and the time in the busy holiday season. So we just want to say thank you for for that. Well, I encourage you, we're going to have uh, several announcements. One of the things that you'll notice, um, we usually send out an email after the ser sermon um, to kind of give out the sermon and the things that we've done here for, for those who are at home. And one of the things that you'll notice in that is uh, my wife and I have created kind of a holiday Christmas playlist. Um, so several different hymns and songs that will go along with the Advent themes that we have um, through uh, Spotify. So if you, all you need to do is create a, a free account for that. There's instructions that will be in the email, and you can look at all the different songs, some of the songs that we had um, this morning that you'll be able to sing as well as other ones. So if you're kind of in the holiday spirit and don't know what to listen to or are sick of kind of the songs you hear on the radio, it seems like they re repeat the same 10 ones over and over and over again. Um, you have uh, some more choices through that. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, so today we're going to be getting a, a new series on Advent called an Advent Playlist. And we're going to be focusing a lot on the different hymns that we usually sing during the Advent season and talking about the purpose of tracing them out, helping us to understand why we sing the songs we sing or should be singing or want to sing or whatever during the holiday season. And so Advent is this time of celebration of anticipating the birth of Jesus. And so everything is kind of geared towards that. We just looked at a sermon series on Colossians um, that we finished up last week, which was really pointing towards that Jesus is the um, supreme and cosmic influence and significance for the world. And now we are focusing more towards that as we get into the Advent season um, with the anticipation of celebrating his birth on Christmas. So the songs that um, we'll hear um, uh, through the, the videos and and all that, um, are kind of giving us a theology of what it means to worship during the Advent season. And so part of our expressions will be things like hope, peace, joy, love, things like that as we wait for um, to celebrate Christ's um, coming at his birth on Christmas. So today we're going to be focusing on the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that you heard right before the sermon, and the passage in the scriptures that inspired it. And so if you have a Bible or you would like to, you know, you have a cell phone, no matter, you can use that or anything that you brought with you, um, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 7, starting in verse um, 10. Let me read that to you. Yes. In verse 10, Isaiah says, Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Shiloh or as high as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask, I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, listen, house of David, it is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you your people and your father's house, such a time as has never been since Ephraim, separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful text in Isaiah. And we have this wonderful passage in Isaiah 7, 14 that this hymn was inspired by. And we um, are looking forward to what you have in store for us and that we can focus on this amazing passage about the, the promise that one day that Jesus will come, the Messiah will come and bring everything right and make all things good because of his work. We thank you, God, for this time that we can be together. I pray, God, that your spirit will be upon us now. We know that you are here, and I pray, God, that you help us to apply this message to our lives. I pray, God, that the words that come in my mouth this morning will be from you, and that we will all be able to listen and hear what God has for us, each and every one of us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. 
So today is the season of Advent. So the, for over the next um, four Sundays, we'll be looking at the different themes. And today, is uh, the theme is on hope. And so today, I wanted to start off, since it's the beginning of Advent season, is kind of give you a little bit of a history of what Advent is and why it's important. So what is Advent? Simply put, Advent focuses on the anticipation that, of the birth of the child, Christ, who will be born leading up to Christmas. And so, however, this is only part of the story. By the fourth century, um, the first, um, first written evidence of Advent is found in Spain and Europe. And so they've been um, looking at this um, Advent season and celebrating in a very important way all the way back to the fourth century AD. So this has been going on for a long time. And so the word Advent is actually derived from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. So it's all about the coming of our Lord. In Greek, the word is parousia, and it's found in many places throughout the New Testament. One of the most famous ones is in 1 Thessalonians 4, which talks about the coming of the Messiah, his second coming, that we anticipate that. And so what we're going to focus on this next four weeks is on the incarnation, more specifically the, the second coming of his um, arrival, not only as a Christ child, but as you know, when he will be coming again in glory. So throughout church history, the Advent candle came to represent the light of Christ into the dark world. We light a candle, and the candle represents that there is now light in the world in the midst of darkness. And so we as Christians should be lights shining in a dark place that we bringing hope and joy to those who we come in contact so the symbol is even more important and illuminated by the fact that Christmas comes around the time of the winter solstice. If you remember any of that from grade school, talking about when the times are, that is the shortest day of the year. So we have um, darkness, and we, I think sunset the last few weeks has been at 4.15, and it'll get, wor- and it'll get l- l- earlier and earlier until we hit the winter solstice, and then the times will start to go back up again. And so during the winter solstice is the darkest time of the year. In fact, some parts of this country in Alaska will not see sunlight for about two months. There'll be a perpetual darkness because of the way the, you know, the Earth's... Um, you know, spinning and the sun and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to give you an astronomy lesson. Otherwise, you know, I'll bore you to tears. And I don't really know much about that anyway. So, um, but this is the thing is that it's so dark world that Jesus has come and brought a bright shining light, the promise of hope. And so the, what is going on here is that for the next two weeks in Advent, the church would reflect on the second coming. And then Christ's followers were to prepare their hearts for the second coming of the Lord. So hope is all about something that's going to happen in the future. And so, yes, we're waiting for Christmas, which is four weeks away, but we await and anticipate when Jesus will come back and bring a lasting hope for the whole world. So for the first two Advent candles, one we celebrate this morning, we'll focus on kind of the future coming of Christ, about hope, about the peace that he is going to be bringing. Then the last two weeks of Advent, we will kind of focus on the first coming of Christ as the Christ child, focusing on the present joy we should have in the midst of suffering and the fact that we should be loving our neighbor. That is kind of the heart of being a Christian. These four themes of hope, peace, joy, and love really surround what it means to be a Christian. So today we will center our attention upon the word hope and its promised future, the culmination that Jesus will come and bring a true everlasting hope for us all. And so we hope and we look forward to what is in store. And so the, light, the candle that was lit this morning through the video is called the prophet's candle. So Isaiah is talking about the hope for the world. One day in verse 14, he says here, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. So it's no coincidence that the hope and and the prophets are linked together because they hope and anticipate the coming of the Messiah. In fact, most of you read through the prophets, talk about this. They anticipate the Messiah coming. Repent, believe, the Messiah is on the way. There's restoration and hope for you in the midst of your sin, in the midst of exile. There is a hope that is coming that will last forever. So what we're going to deal with here is that as ones who spoke of the Lord, the people of Israel, these prophets were also bringing hope to the world. So today's hymn is focused on the word hope, not just as God would come and rescue his people, but that he would actually dwell with them. 
He would be with us. See, God comes in the person of Christ and then the Holy Spirit comes upon you when you trust in Jesus to walk with you in this life. He's always with you. He's right there. He's not way up in the sky waiting for you to speak to him. He is with you. He is among us now. He's waiting to hear from you and he wants you to pray and think of him and think of the hope that he will one day bring you when he does return. So this hymn is all about the fact that Emmanuel is here. What does Emmanuel mean? That God is with us. So the, the, this wonderful hymn, this O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, was originally lit and written over a thousand years ago. And it was originally written in Latin. Thankfully, we did not listen to this, the Latin hymn this morning. But I've heard it before. It's very, very beautiful and how it's sung. And so over 12th century, these monasteries, these converts throughout Christendom, would talk about this final week of Advent and chant all kinds of things about these verses that they would be talking about during their evening services. And so one of the hymns that came out of this, um, if you ever read through Luke's story of the gospel in the first chapter about the Magnificat, about Mary's song of hope. And so they would think of on this and they would ponder this theme throughout this hope and they would chant it. Things like, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. O come, O come, Emmanuel's haunting and evocative melody, which for many epitomizes the spirit of Advent. And it seems to have originated all the way back to the 15th century, this processional of French Franciscan nuns who would sing this, and then it was translated in 1851. This hymn goes way back. Sometimes we think that somebody kind of wrote this in kind of their back room in the 1950s with a piano and said, hey, let's, these things go back a long way. And so John um, McNeil in his um, Medieval Hymns um, book, which you can actually still purchase, talks about this hymn and translates it from the original language, and that's what we have today. So if you look at your hymn, though, you'll notice that in the, um, the book there, if you have one at home or whatever, you'll have this, the psalm there, and the, um, the scripture verse is actually Isaiah 14. So that is the kind of the history behind these hymns. Now, while we do not know the precise date of the events that were going on in Israel, it's definitely possible that they would occur about a decade before the northern kingdom fell. Remember, if you kind of back to your Sunday school days, of kind of the, the, that Israel was one nation under David, and then later kind of split into two. You had Israel in the north, and you had Judah in the south, and they were kind of warring against each other. And so this is going on about a decade before the Assyrians came in and completely decimated north Israel. And so we're kind of looking around the time of 722. So put yourself in that context because this is what's going on. See, the promise that God talks about here in this text that Isaiah is referring to goes all the way back to like the 8th century B.C. So remember, around this time, you had the split of the two kingdoms. And so you had this evil king in Judah, the king Ahaz. And so he's looking for help because he's getting attacked from two different warring enemies. From Syria and then Israel from the north, one to just completely destroy Judah. And so what is, Isaiah, uh, what is Ahaz trying to do here? He's looking for help. He's a king about to be attacked. And so what does he do? He reaches out to another nation that actually is one of his enemies Assyria, to help him fight this other two kingdoms that are coming against him. So what has happened here is you have Syria and, Nor and, and Israel who are attacking Judah and what the express purpose that they wanted to get rid of Ahaz and put someone named Tebel on the throne in his place. Look at verse 6 of chapter 7. They said, let us go up against Judah, terrorize it, and conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Tabel's son as king in it. They wanted to install their own puppet king there so they could do whatever they wanted in Judah. Somebody would come in and conquer that area and set up a puppet king so they would have now three nations that would become one, which would allow the Syrians then to come in and decimate North Israel. 
So what they were doing is they were waiting for what was going to happen here. And so they wanted to remove Ahaz from the throne because of his unwillingness to join their coalition. Be like kind of a country saying, well, we're not going to be with you unless you join our coalition. And if you don't join our coalition, then we are going to invade you. So what is going on here is that they intended to do what? To install this puppet king who would be able to be more easily manipulated. This is all about kings trying to get land. And this is the context which Isaiah is coming into. See, these these passages that sometimes we read, and we read out of context to talk about the Emmanuel son of of God, that the virgin will be born, and and he will be born in Bethlehem, and he will be Emmanuel, God with us. We think, where did that come from? Well, this is the context where it's coming from. So Ahaz and his cabinet are terrified about what may happen. They are so frightened that the text says they were what? Verse 2. When he became known to the house of David and Aram, had occupied Ephraim, the, the heart of Ahaz and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. They were literally shaking. I don't know if you've ever been terrified or had a panic attack or frustrated to the point where you were visually shaking, physically shaking, nervous about what was going to happen. Terrified. This is what Ahaz and his cabinet are doing. What is going on here? Our nation is about to be destroyed. So meanwhile, the prophet Isaiah is trying to encourage Ahaz to do what? Trust in the Lord. Trust in him. Trust that he will restore you. Trust that he will be able to get you through this. And God does not want them to Trust in the wisdom of man, but trust in him. See, Ahaz is basically saying here, well, I'm not going to trust in God. I am going to take matters into my own hands, and I am going to do whatever I think is best because I am the king, and the king knows everything. So therefore, I am going to do whatever I want because I am king and I am all wise. So Isaiah knows about what Ahaz is going to do, and he wants the king of Ahaz to know that there will be severe consequences for not trusting in God. Fine, if you don't want to trust in God, here is what is going to happen. As one commentator has pointed out, the prophet Isaiah wants King Ahaz to remember one thing, that God, the Holy One of Israel, is great enough and wise enough that he can be trusted. It's kind of like when we put our trust in someone, we usually look to them and we know, hey, this is a person that I can trust. I've gone to this person before. They've always been there for me. They never tell me lies. They never tell me fake stories. They never give me half the truth. They're always there for me. They're wise. They're a a position of good character and maybe great reputation. And so I can trust in them. And so Isaiah is pleading with the king Ahaz, you can go to God. He's trustworthy. He's always been there for you. So what happens is is that you have this hope for the kingdom if Ahaz would just kind of come to his senses and trust in the Lord. However, King Ahaz would rather trust his own country into another known enemy, Assyria, to deliver him from these other two nations of Syria and Israel that are kind of trying to destroy him. So he's looking towards another enemy to help him solve his problem of what, how is he going to keep his nation together. So this is what's going on. Rather than trusting in the Lord who is all-knowing and powerful, he trusts in another enemy of his, hoping that they will, in their good promises, come and help Ahaz. Little does he know that Assyria wants to defeat Judah and is using northern Israel and Judah, and, and sorry, and the kingdom of Syria to come and kill him and destroy the kingdom. So Isaiah replies to King Ahaz, his stubbornness, with a sign from God of Emmanuel saying, God is with us. He is with you. This whole chapter of Isaiah 7 is broken down into two parts about Isaiah's call to King Ahaz to trust in the Lord. 
The second part is all about this sign of Emmanuel, that in the first nine verses of Isaiah 7, Isaiah encourages Ahaz to stand firm in the faith and trust in the God and Lord. Look what he says in verse 3. The Lord said to Isaiah, go out with your son, Sher Japo, and to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road to Launder's field. So what Isaiah is saying here is that unless Ahaz trusts in God, he will be doomed by his fear. Remember, he is shaking like a palm branch in the wind. Shaking, physically upset, nervous, doesn't know what's going to happen. And so he is nervous. And so what Isaiah is saying is, put away your fear. Trust in the Lord and things will be okay. So verse 4 says, say to him, calm down and be quiet. Has the Lord ever told you that? Or has someone said, calm down and be quiet? One of the things that I try not to do ever with my wife is tell her to calm down. If you want to get in trouble with your spouse, do not tell her to calm down. That's like rule number one. Listen to the woman and don't tell her to calm down. That's basic marriage stuff. Don't calm down. So what is, uh, Isaiah is trying to get this king to calm down, be quiet. Don't be afraid. Don't be a coward and go after and look for this help from um, Assyria, helping and hoping that they will come to your help. Don't be afraid or cowardly, verse 4, because of these two smoldering sticks, the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram. So these two guys were trying to get at Ahaz to change his mind, and they were afraid that these two guys were going to take over and he would lose his kingdom or his power. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to figure out a way not only to keep his power, but also to save his kingdom. And so he's got two choices. He can either trust in God, or he can trust in Assyria, another enemy, hoping that they will come to his rescue. Verse 5, for Aram, along with Ephraim and the son of Ramallah, has plotted harm against you. That is why he's afraid. He is afraid that he's either going to be assassinated or that he will lose his kingdom. It's all about power for Ahaz. It's not about trusting God. It's not about thinking about who God is and what God can do in a situation. It's all about power. I want to be the king here. I'm the king. I know what's best. I don't need to listen to God. So verse 6 says, they said, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and conquer it for ourselves. And then we can instill Tabaz, son of king, in it. So what happens is, is this other territory wants to come in and take over Judah. This is what's going on here. So we have this passage that what's going on is that Paul, and I'm sorry, Paul, God, I've had the last sermon series all about Colossians, so I, got, I still have Paul on my brain. But God wants him to do what? To act in faith and trust God to protect King Ahaz and his people. So even though that King Ahaz is an evil king, God still thinks that Ahaz can come to faith and be able to protect his people. God still cares for him even in the midst of his sin. So God is pulling out all the stops to try to move Ahaz to faith. Look at verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Shelah or as high as heaven. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz. God is telling Ahaz, just ask for a sign and I'm here. Just say, God, I need you. I need you to help me out. I need a sign for you to know that I am here, that you are there with me to help me in this process. And we probably have done this in ourselves. where We get to those points where we're so down that we go, God, just give me a sign just something to kind of grab my attention so I can know that you're there, so I can trust in you. So the Lord is actually telling Ahaz to do that. Look at how Ahaz responds. Verse 12, but Ahaz replied, I will not ask, I will not test the Lord. 
Ahaz responds with stubbornness. No, I'm not doing that. I am the king. I've got it all figured out. It's going to work out. I don't need God. He refuses help from the Lord. So verse 12, he says, I will not ask, I will not test. So what does Isaiah do? Isaiah says, fine, if God's not going to help you or you're not going to ask God for help, because Ahaz is like, I got this figured out. I don't need to trust in the Lord. Even though he's coming to me to help me, I'm going to push God to the side and I'm going to do my own thing. And Isaiah knows that that is the wrong decision. So what does Isaiah do? He brings Ahaz a sign of hope. Even though Ahaz does not want to ask the Lord for help, the prophet is there to help Ahaz make a good decision. He could just say, hey, you know what? You're on your own, Ahaz. I've had enough of you. I'm done. But no, what does the prophet do? Verse 13. Look at this wonderful passage. He says, Isaiah said, listen, house of David, the entire kingdom. Is it not enough for you to try patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? Why are you going after this other kingdom to ask for help when he is a known enemy? What are you doing? Won't you try your patience to God? Maybe you're not looking at this in the right fashion. See, well, sometimes we want an answer right away. God, I need help with such and such. I need you to fix this problem right now. I am frustrated. I need you to come to me now. And then what does God do? Sometimes he will, sometimes he won't. And then what, what do we do is we say, well, God, if you're not gonna come, I'm done. I'm gonna do my own thing. So we look at the short-term situation and we want the quick fix rather than looking at the long-term situation that God sees and God knows what's going to happen. See, he sees the future before he even knows and before you know what the future is going to be. He already has it figured out. So what is Isaiah saying here? You've got two choices. You can either try a short-term solution or you can trust in the Lord for the future. And so this is what's going on here with Isaiah and Ahaz until he gets to verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. If you're not going to ask for one, he'll give you one. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and ah honey. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you your people and your father's house, such as a time has never been since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Isaiah is basically giving them a sign and saying, the king you have a present situation. And so I'm going to bring a present hope and a future significance to you. See, Isaiah wants the king to know that God is with them and so that he does not need to fear what others will do to him because if he trusts in the Lord, the Lord will protect him. So he wants to reassure King Ahaz that he does not need to go to Assyria for help. And then the future significance is that there will be a hope on the horizon one day of the Messiah who will be born of a virgin, that he will rescue people from evil, that he will restore them to new life and dwell with them. That is the future promise you have. And Ahaz can be a part of that promise by just trusting in the Lord. So Isaiah wants King Ahaz to remember that God's presence must be accounted for in every decision he makes. He can't just say, I'm the king, I'm going to make a decision. See, there is hope here that if King Ahaz trusts in God and not in human wisdom, that he and his people will be saved. This is what Isaiah is trying to get us, is that make sure that you look to God for every decision. So when you have a decision to make in life, the first thing that we need to do is to ask God for wisdom. That is what God wants. God wants us to ask him because he knows what you need. But we tend to, in our humanity, to do what? 
I, I got this. Let me do my own thing. Let me figure this out. Let me make a pro and con list. Let me counsel with somebody. Let me talk to my best buddy. Let me do this. And then if that doesn't work, then maybe I'll seek out God. But what it, uh, Isaiah is trying to do here is trying to get the king to say, you have to trust in the Lord first. Not look to human wisdom, not look to, his, not look to someone else's counsel, but look to God's counsel. However, Ahaz is what? He's short-sighted. He just sees the situation. Remember, he's shaking in fear, and so he wants that to go away, and so he wants this problem to be solved today, if not yesterday. He wants it now. He wants a drive-through service of help. Little does he know that this will not only be his undoing, but the undoing of the entire nation. See, he's looking to a king in in, in, in Syria who's trying to come and conquer him. Doesn't that sound ridiculous to you? Hey, I'm going to ask help for a king and a, a kingdom that wants to take you over. So I'm hoping and pleading that maybe I can get on his good graces and he'll come and help me with my problem. So Isaiah wants Ahaz to look to the future aspect here. See, there's more that's going on here that Ahaz is not even looking at. He doesn't see down the road. He just sees right in front of him. And Isaiah wants him to understand that there is a future blessing if he will just trust in the Lord. That's what he wants. And that's what we do. We tend to think, hey, I've got a situation, I've got a problem, it's got to be fixed today. And we just look right here and we don't look forward into the future and we don't ask God to help us. I think there's a lot that we can learn from this story. First, if any decision that comes out of fear will almost always turn out bad. So if something happens in your life and you get scared, nervous, afraid, upset, frustrated, if you make a decision when your body is shaking, when you're nervous, when you got that weird thing going on in your stomach and you're anxious and you want to reach for the Tums and you're in that state and you make a decision, I can guarantee you it's the wrong one. So what does the Lord say here in his text? He says in verse 4, say to him, calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly. If you're upset, you get an email from somebody and you don't like it and you want to just go on the offensive, you want to attack, you're frustrated, you're mad, you're angry. The last thing you want to do is send that email when you're in a state of anger, fear, anxiety, shaking, whatever it is. Take some time off. Sleep on it. You might have heard that saying before. Go to bed. See how you feel in the morning. Is that situation going to be radically changed if you wait a good night's sleep? Probably not. There are very few decisions in this world that you have to make an immediate right now decision. Yes, emergencies come up and you need to make a decision, but even then you can still pray to God. The worst night of my life was March 3rd when my wife was bleeding out at home. And I thought she was going to die. And I didn't know what to do. And I'm in a panic. And I'm shaking. And I'm scared. And I'm afraid. And I don't know what to do. And so it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I can't call the doctor. The doctor's an hour away. What do I do? And I just stop for one second while my wife is bent over in pain. And I just said a quick prayer. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. You need help. And so what happened in that situation was I said, I've got, he said, call the doctor. So I called the doctor at 3 o'clock in the morning. He calls me back 15 minutes later, and he walks me through what to do. If I had made a decision in that, I probably could have called the ambulance or whatever. We could have been in a different hospital, and then what? we got to have my wife air flighted from one hospital to the next for his surgery. I could have made a really bad decision because I was scared to death. I was sweating bullets. 
And I'm really thankful and grateful that God was able to help me through that situation and help me to understand that I need to ask help for him because I was, I was down and out. I didn't know what to do in that situation. Now, maybe some of us maybe have never had a situation like that, or maybe you have, but what God wants us to do in those situations is to never make a decision when we are in the midst of anxiety, fear, depression, frustration, whatever. Don't let your emotions take over. Be calm. Obey God. God wants us to turn to him for help in making decisions. He wants us to look to him. He wants us to be thoughtful, calm, and trust in God for guidance. See, God knows the future. He knows exactly what your decision is going to make and when he's going to keep you and how that's going to work out. See, King Ahaz thought he was showing devotion to God by saying, I will not test God. I will not ask him. See, the scriptures tell us to not test God, but there is something quite different when God is supplying the test. See, God approaches Ahaz and says, hey, just ask me and I will help you. And so what does Ahaz do? He says, well, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be obedient to God because God and his scriptures tell me that I'm not supposed to put God to the test. So I'm going to look like I'm being devoted to God and holy. So I'm not going to ask for his help because that would be against his don't put God to the test. It's the same exercise that Satan uses against Jesus in the, in the what? In the desert. He th- throws scripture verses out to Jesus And Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, you've got the whole passage wrong. You've interpreted it wrong. So when God tells us to be obedient, what we need to do is just be obedient and obey him and allow all the consequences of our obedience to go to him. Just trust in him. He's got your back. Ahaz's mistake was that he was trying to appear as if he was devoted to God. But if he was truly devoted to God, Ahaz would have trusted in the Lord and not the Assyrians. So he's trying to cover up the fact that he doesn't have any faith with this veneer of this devotion to religion and not generally trusting in the Lord. So God's sign ultimately brought Ahaz's unbelief to light. Signs confirm faith. So what did God do? God says, Ahaz, trust in me. And Ahaz says, "Uh uh-uh. Well, now I know that Ahaz has never cared for me. He doesn't trust in me, and he never will. So signs don't necessarily create faith. They, what they do is they, he wants us to know that we can make a decision, and we have to put our faith in God when we make that decision. When God brings you a sign, we need to step in that and be faithful. He wants us to seek his wise counsel and come to him first at the beginning of the process, not when we don't have any other options. God does not want us to be weary and kind of wearing this veneer of faith and devotion without kind of a true devotion of faith. This veneer of, I gotta be, hel- I gotta be holy, I've gotta figure this out because I'm in charge and God's not, so I've gotta kind of wear my holy there than thou clothes so it looks to God that I'm a holy person. that kind of like psychological gymnastics that we make. And so we may say, well, hey, going to church is important and doing daily devotions and striving to be a godly, have a godly life and having a, being a person of integrity and all those things are vitally important to the faith. But if we are doing them to get God for us to do something without actually having a genuine faith in him, it's never gonna work. And they can actually be a deadly substitute for faith in God. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 7, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and it was great of that fall was. This is what Ahaz does. He puts his whole future in the hands of an enemy territory and does not trust in God, hoping that this veneer of faith will help him to know that the Lord is there. But he is building his foundation on on quicksand. See, fruit should flow from faith. 
Because we are faithful, because we have trust in God, we should be overflowing the fruits that we do, the fruits of the Spirit, things like hope, peace, joy, love, things that we talk about during the Advent season. Pastor Old Testament scholar John Oswald has defined faith beautifully on this. He says, faith in God is a radical, soul-encompassing surrender to the love of God demonstrated to us in God is with us, Emmanuel. God is with us, and that should give us hope for the future, a hope that the prophet Isaiah described 2,700 years ago. And in this same hope that inspired this great hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, through the person of Jesus, we no longer are alone. We have someone who is with us. God is with us in Christ. This means that we can live and walk by faith and we don't have to be afraid and we don't have to be shaking in the wind when something happens to us that we can trust in him and know that he will bring us through it. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are also conformed to his image. And then nothing, and I mean nothing, will be against you and, and be at you if God is for you. And God is for us if we trust in him. He loves you and he wants you to come to himself. And so no matter what happens in life, we can know that God is for us. So while we can be hurt physically and emotionally, and some of us may have been hurt physically or emotionally, maybe this has happened recently, but that hurt does not have to have eternal consequences. If we submit our lives and our hearts to Christ, our eternal destiny is what? It's already secure. No other human being can change that. No matter what they do to you, they cannot change your eternal destiny. So while we face the possibility of harm in this life by the hands of others, we will ultimately be saved, and we place our hope in that. We live by the fact that our Emmanuel has done what? Has defeated death through the resurrection. And we wait for Jesus' second coming, knowing that he will bring light, future light to a dark world that will change everything that's going on in our lives. And some of us may be living in a dark world right now, in our own little bubbles of life. Things that are not going the way we hope, or maybe we're under attack by all kinds of other people or whatever the situation is, and we feel like we're living in a dark world, and we don't know if there's hope on the horizon, but in Jesus we know the Emmanuel is with us. As the hymn describes, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. So during this Advent season, we can live in hope because our Emmanuel is with us. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for the fact that um, you're with us and you're always there and we can always look to you for the things that we need in this life, God. And there's so many of us right now who are in going through a lot in the midst of this crazy world, God. And I just pray, God, that you will keep us safe and sound and that we will continue to trust in you. For any of us who, that are here today or will be hearing this message later this afternoon or, or whenever they feel that they have time to listen, I just pray, God, that some of them may not know you. And some of them have, may have not trusted in you. And so I pray, God, that today that the spirit will be upon them, that they'll be able to trust in you. And if you're wondering, how do I become a Christian? How do I trust in God now and in the future? All you need to do with me right now is pray this prayer. Father, I've made a mess of my life and I don't know what's going on and I feel that I have done things that I'm ashamed of and I feel like I am a sinner and I ask you for forgiveness and I want to trust in you today for my salvation. And I want to look to you for the future for it as well. And God, I hope and pray that you will be with me now and that you'll walk with me in this life and help me to be the person that you want me to be in Christ. If you have prayed that prayer today, you are a child of God. And I ask that you will um, talk to somebody, talk to me, talk to elder, talk to anyone who is a Christian and, and tell them about it so that we can walk with you and bring you up in the body of Christ. God, we thank you for this many wonderful blessings you've given us today. And I pray, God, that we will continue to focus on you as we walk through the Advent season together. In your name we pray. Amen.